Good morning, everybody. Morning, San Francisco. How are you all doing? Fantastic. All right. Good morning. So I'm here today to talk about innovation and about our product roadmap and how we look at this going forward. And what I want to set up here is that we're going to be talking about um, our roadmap, the innovation that we've delivered and we will be delivering, and really try to help you understand how we think about the AnyPoint platform and also how the AnyPoint platform can help you to achieve those application networks that we've been hearing about. So let's start off by taking a look at our safe harbor. Our lawyers told me I had to show this. And now we have our innovations from 2016. We've done a lot since 2016. It's been an amazing year with over 173 releases delivered, over 1,000 product improvements, and over close to 200 customer-driven enhancements. And for our customers and our partners that are here today, I really want to say thank you to all of you for your partnership, for really helping us drive the product to what it is today. And we've had over 23 uh, major upgrades, so close to two upgrade, major upgrades every month. And we've built these along the specific dimensions of built-in best practices, enabling more use cases for you and your developers, um, and finally driving towards operational excellence. Now, uh, if we can go back one. So if we take a look at built-in best practices, what we really have is uh, starting with our healthcare catalyst. This is a package set of connectors, templates, uh, examples, as well as microservices examples, all packaged up, enabled in Exchange, available for download and use inside of the Studio environment, enabling you to accelerate your startup inside of Studio. In Studio 6.2, we enabled uh, better Maven integration for tighter integration to your continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. Um, as well, we enabled custom policy editors for APIs. And with API Sync, we enabled the connection between both the APIs that are designed in the cloud as well as the implementations that are designed on the desktop. Now, next, with new use cases, we shipped our new cloud-based object store, enabling a whole host of new use cases in the cloud. Uh, the ability to share state between mule runtimes, as well as the places where we need to share state for different kinds of policies that we ship. With flow management, or sorry, with resource level policies, we really focused on the more detailed policies that are applied at the API level. And with big, big data connectors, uh, with these connectors, we enabled access to systems like Kafka and Spark and Redis and MongoDB. Now, with operational excellence, we know that it's incredibly important for you to drive towards the visibility and the knowledge of what is actually running and operating. And here we have extended API analytics, both for the API provider as well as the API consumer. We have detailed flow management. Uh, the ability to stop and start flows and actually debug into a mule runtime. And finally, use cases like self-service VPN, enabling you to reconfigure the connection between the cloud and the ground as and when you need and when you see fit. So all these examples of operational excellence. Now, as I look at the innovations coming up in 2017, I really want to ground us in some of the conversations that we've had over the course of this week. Um, as Greg talked about there is hyper-specialization occurring across all industries and across all domains. Um, and Ross showed this yesterday. As we move from a place where we're looking at these large monolithic systems that are behind the firewall to a place where there are a host of services that are available, um, whether those are capability services or whether those are infrastructure services or whether those are additional data and devices, there's all these additional systems that we need to interact with. But what's actually critical here is, in addition to the technology landscape, it's truly the team and organization landscape that is also changing. As we take a look at all these different kinds of systems, we've got all the different teams that are interacting with this. We've got the IT organizations that are maybe running and operating those monolithic SaaS applications as well as the uh, package applications. As we look at, though, the uh, more granular SaaS applications, 
um, or the microservices that are being created. We start to see different kinds of teams that are coming in. Smaller teams, teams that are, you know, uh, we call them pizza box size teams. So teams that are about the size that you can feed with a single pizza, right? And, and why do we do this? Why do we do this with these smaller teams? Well, it's part of that specialization that we've been talking about. By focusing down the development into these co-located teams, we're able to try to accelerate development and, and increase velocity by keeping the same pace that that five-person startup can see, even as we grow to hundreds, thousands, and in some cases, tens of thousands of developers in the organization. Now, as we look at productivity, uh, productivity per individual as teams and as organizations grow. There's an interesting productivity inflection point. And some organizations go through this. Um, you know, Ross made people do a show of hands. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, this is an example from somebody, team that we know. It took them over three months, and they had to spend $1.8 million to do a single database field change. But we believe that there's another way. We, we believe that the inflection curve can actually go in the other direction. And we believe this because there are companies out there that are proving this. There's a company out there about the same size, overall organization size, doing 13,000 builds per day, many of these being actually deployed out into production. And this is Amazon. So the question really becomes, how do we go from the bottom to the top? And here's the thing. We've talked about uh, focusing development. We've talked about creating hyper-specialization. We've talked about focusing development on these core functions and accelerating that pizza box size team. The thing, though, is what happens is as each function and as each core component is accelerated, you still need to bring everything back together again to deliver innovation to your customers. So rather than integration and composition being at the edges of the monolith, it fundamentally becomes the center of what happens as those teams come together. And without a new approach to composition, what happens is that those development teams do not the wrong thing on purpose, but they do what's most obvious and what's most immediate. So every project creates another point-to-point -point integration with the other systems they need to hook into. And what happens is as more projects occur, and as more of those integrations occur, we end up with the N squared problem of every system connecting to every other system, complexity increases, and we get to a large scale distributed system, but one that's completely interdependent and is highly fragile. And that leads to the database field change that costs $1.8 million and takes three months. But we believe that there's a different way. And that is the application network. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the benefits of the application network. You've seen that over the course of the last couple of days. What I really want to focus on is how do we create one of these? How do we get our teams and enable our teams to actually build one of these? We believe that application networks emerge uh, when teams build with consistent contracts in place and a real focus on those contracts in between the components. But that's not sufficient. What they also need is a real focus on uh, reuse and recomposition as a guiding principle, as a way to do development. And in order to really do that well, they need discoverability and access to all of the existing assets, understanding what's actually already out there. And this is how we get agility with quality. This is how we drive to great architecture without heavyweight architectural processes. All this is built ground up, project by project. Now, the other aspects that are critically important are visibility, security, and governability built in and or out of the box. And, and why do I say built in or out of the box? Because if we, enable, if we leave it to each team to independently try to create the visibility, security, and governance across the organization, what we end up with is everybody trying to do the right thing, but again, doing different things. You might have one team that tracks their dependencies inside of Jira, another inside of Git, another inside of Excel. So now you have all of these different environments, data spread all over. And now as you try to do dependency tracking, there's no way to actually create a system around it and actually automate that. And the same thing happens with availability and resiliency. 
If it's left to every single team, every team will try to do the right thing, but they'll end up with slightly different implementations, slightly different architectures. I see some nods out there. This often happens, and you end up with the slight disconnect as bridges are built from two sides, and at the end, they're off of about three feet. And then that's where friction starts to occur. So what are the enablers for teams to be able to do this? It's really these two key aspects of having concrete APIs, well-defined contracts, but these contracts alone are not sufficient. You need to be able to compose and bring these together. And actually, through composition, being able to recompose them and restructure them over time and refactor as you need to. So we have architected the AnyPoint platform from the ground up to enable all of these capabilities for you and your developers. Across the top in blue, we have our tooling infrastructure with our design tools, enabling those contracts to be defined, enabling those composites to be created. Uh, we have our management tools, enabling the visibility and governance, and our engagement capabilities to drive the collaboration across. And across the bottom, we have all of our runtime services and runtime capabilities, along with that core Mule runtime engine, enabling the operation and production, enabling the scalability and the resiliency. So what I'd like to do now is take a look at the overall uh, development lifecycle. Now, your teams might use slightly different words. Um, you, there some of you might be using waterfall, others might be using agile, others might be using scrum. But regardless, this is the overall lifecycle that any uh, IT or product organization uses to go from ideation and design all the way through to operation. And inside the design phase, what the AnyPoint platform enables is the authoring um, of that contract, of the API, with API Designer, and the ability to simulate that API with our mocking services. And these mocking services are interesting because this also enables a separation between the request for information and content and the implementation. As an API designer, you can use the mocking service to start to understand how users will use your system even before you build out the implementation. But interestingly, as an API consumer, as an application developer, or as a mobile developer, you can create the API for yourself and actually stand it up and continue on with your work even as the back end is being built out. So that's what the mocking service enables. Um, we have API console for gathering feedback and documentation of our APIs. And we have API notebooks uh, for the validation and uh, interaction with the APIs as they're defined. And you saw URI actually use this yesterday. So this is the combination of static text and documentation along with live scripting blocks, allowing you to actually interact with the API in real time as you're learning about it. Now, the next phase we have is dev and test. And here we have our studio environment for building out those composite solutions. And we have MUnit for testing, so we can enable dev and test at the same time taking those all the way through the life cycle. And finally, we know that connect connectivity is incredibly important. So we have our connectors to enable easier access to all of those external systems. Now, as we look at this design and dev test phases of the life cycle, what we really wanted to look at is how can we expand the audience of participants in your organizations that are a part of creating that application network? So today what we have is these core integration specialists. Uh, these are folks who are highly skilled and strategic, focusing on creating reusable components, um, oftentimes inside of uh, central IT um, or core development. They love IDEs. They're working in Java or .NET. But the thing that we know is that there are over six times as many developers at the edges and users of the system at the edges. Uh, these might be people who need access to data, like a, uh, like a data analyst. Um, they need to get a task done. It might be the line of business IT uh, that's working with the marketing team to connect up two systems. So these are task focused. They need to get through this, the system very quickly. And it doesn't have to be web-based, but it really helps if it is because uh, the, the web-based tooling allows people to get on, get their tasks done, and move on with their primary activities. And then finally, across the bottom, we have sort of generically what we're calling application developers. These are the consumers 
of the APIs as well as all the products and all the services that are being created by those other two layers. Now, as we expand out the set of developers and the audience of participants in the application network, the other thing we're really looking at that's driving us in our design and dev test phase of the lifecycle um, is really driving greater velocity for those teams uh, through these five different characteristics. The first is by unifying API design um, and application creation. So the combination of the contract as well as the composition. Uh, then enabling more and more visual tooling, enabling those ad hoc integrators to really come into the environment, but also enabling your more skilled uh, specialists to onboard more quickly and learn about the environment. Uh, the simplified runtime will also enable a faster onboarding uh, for all of those integration specialists. And then we talked about the lifecycle before for the composition. We want to enable both design and test and dev and test throughout the entire cycle. And then finally, by having engagement throughout the entire cycle, truly driving best practices, driving reuse, and helping your teams to build that application network. So let's take a look at what the design center is going to be doing. So we have our, our APIs, our contracts, uh, and we talked about the composites and the composites that's needed. And what Design Center will do is actually bring both of these together, enabling collaboration across projects that have both the API specification as well as the composite services. And this is important because we've heard from many of you that oftentimes what happens is somebody creates a great API specification. When it starts to get implemented, the API specification is not kept up to date with the implementation. And unfortunately, what happens then is the specification falls by the wayside, it stops getting used, and all the value and all the richness that you could have gotten from it is then wasted. So we're going to bring all this together into the design center to allow a single lifecycle through uh, both API creation as well as composition. So we have our tools today, our API designer, which is uh, there's a net new version of this coming out that we'll show a little bit later, and also our studio environment for those integration specialists. Now, in addition to these integration specialists, we have our ad hoc integrators, and we have our new visual API designer that will be coming out in the second half of this year, along with Flow Designer, which again we'll show in a little bit. And finally, for your testers, we have API testing, again coming out in the second half of this year, and enhancements to MUnit. Now, those testers could be the same people who are doing design, dev test is also fine, but enabling this all at the same time at the point of creation. And what this really does is allows us to have this API development lifecycle and this connectivity flow lifecycle. These two can be run independently, or now they can be run in concert, both one enabling the other, enabling you to take these APIs and these comp compositions all the way through from the developer's desktop all the way into production. Now, let me just quickly run through Flow Designer. We have here is our web-based self-service tooling. Uh, the SDLC, or Software Development Lifecycle, is built in with environments and progression uh, and testing as well, driving greater collaboration between all the participants in your organization that are working in the design center, uh, and giving you visibility across both what's being created by the uh, integration specialist as well as what's being created by the ad hoc integrator. Now, Flow Designer is deeply integrated into Exchange, enabling discovery, collaboration, and, and reuse of assets. And critically, it is powered by the Mule runtime. And this is important because what this means is that the Flow Designer is actually creating Mule applications. And this allows us to have this seamless progression from the simpler tooling for the ad hoc developers all the way to the more complex and power use cases that will be developed by the, uh, by the integration specialists. And so if you have a project that starts inside a flow designer and needs a little more help, the, it can be handed off to the integration specialist that can complete the project inside of Studio. Or even better, it will encourage those integration specialists to create reusable components which can then be loaded up into Exchange and then brought back into Flow Designer for future developers who are using the visual tooling. So this cycle of information, understanding what's needed, building reusable assets, and then putting in Exchange just continues this cycle and the interaction between these two environments. In addition to that, we have inside of Studio itself is an acceleration of onboarding and development with 
Studio based on Mule 4. Mule 4 is our next generation runtime engine based on Mule 3. Um, for all of the developers and experts that you have in Mule 3 today, Mule 4 will be a seamless transition for them, something that they will feel very comfortable with. Um, but for new developers, the more compact language will allow simpler onboarding and uh, faster time to efficacy for those developers. As well, the runtime engine has additional APIs available, uh, so that will enable easier troubleshooting as well as simplified upgrades. Now, we talked about connectivity and um, what we're doing in the context of broader and broad-based connections across systems. And we talked about our new connectors into the big data systems. We have over 80 connectors now into all of these types of external systems. Um, and there's more coming in 2017. In addition, we have our partner, uh, MuleSoft certified partner developed connectors as well. Um, and we have many more of those coming out in 2017. Now, two at the bottom, we have Pega and Appian who have developed RAML specifications that are MuleSoft certified. And this is a new program that we have. This is important because these are API specifications that are MuleSoft certified. So no connector was built, just an API specification. Why is that important? Well, we know that there are over 17,000 public APIs available today. And there's another uh, stat that says there's over 500 um, applications uh, on average used in every enterprise. So fundamentally, we need to scale our connectivity development in order to reach these kinds of numbers. And so those MuleSoft uh, certified APIs are important because in addition to having Java for connector development, we're announcing REST Connect, which creates instant connectivity. So simply by having an API specification, we will be able to automatically generate a connector for you into those external systems. So now creating a connector is as easy as creating an API specification. Thank you. Thank you. In addition, we want to create those, we want to enable those more complex connectors to be more simply created as well. And what better tool do we have for data manipulation, data orchestration, and transformation than Mule? So we'll, we're going to enable all of your Mule developers to be able to create those connectors in the context of Mule itself, package that, and enable that to be found, discovered, and reused by others. All right. So now let's move on to deployment and operation. Um, in this part of the lifecycle, what we have today is we have our API manager for promotion and governance, the application of policies. Uh, we have our runtime manager for deployment and overall monitoring of your uh, applications. And as we look at this, these phases of deployment and operation, it's really about driving greater operational excellence across the entire organization and across this entire flow. These are the key topics that we have here. The first is, again, unifying APIs um, and those composite services, enabling them to be bundled and brought as a package across all the environments. Um, faster troubleshooting and detection. So when you actually, if there is an issue, the ability to detect where that issue is, the ability to de debug very rapidly, and come back online again. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we're driving greater, greater levels of security. Um, and finally, we're going to be enabling uh, much more capabilities across all clouds in a multi-cloud environment. All right, so runtime manager, uh, really aligning development and operations. I talked before about how it's not just about the technology, but it's about the teams that we have and about all those core functions that are being built, unit by unit. But what happens now is each of those components, either microservices or each of those uh, fit-for-purpose functions, needs to make its way into production with phases through uh, system tests, integration tests, all these different phases. And one of the things we really want to do is enable environment awareness for Mule applications. So we've separated configurations from the Mule applications themselves, making those configurations a first-class citizen, allowing you to tag those configurations to different environments so that Mule applications can be progressed through those environments without needing reconfiguration. 
really accelerating the overall uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline, and also with additional APIs for simple integration for those tools as well. And finally, enabling uh, better troubleshooting throughout the entire lifecycle, because we know that what happens is you start in development, but as you progress through those different environments, whether it's uh, QA, stage tests, et cetera, all the way into production, you need the same level of monitoring and troubleshooting across all the environments, because this is where all of those composite services start coming together, and when you start actually seeing the interaction between the different teams and between the different services. Now, as we look at API Manager, we look at the API, overall API lifecycle. And again, the unification of APIs and composites and enabling environments and that same environment awareness for APIs as well. It's really important because then we can actually uh, attach those APIs to the different services that are in each of the environments and have testing all the way through. And speaking of testing, one of the points here is that you know, our customers have often told us that as they stand up proxies, the first thing that they typically do is they stand up the proxy and then they go and they manually test it to make sure that the backend system is there, to make sure that the policies are being applied correctly, and so on. And when we look at that, first thing we think to ourselves is manual testing doesn't make sense in this environment. You can't actually test all these APIs as they're being rolled out. So those API tests that I talked about before that are being created in the design time, those API tests will be carried through all those environments. You'll be able to tag them to automatically run as proxies are stood up in the environments. And finally, as your API ends up in production, those tests end up becoming part of the monitoring system for that API, telling you that it's always healthy and it's kept up to date. Amazing closure of that full life cycle. Now, on policy management, uh, we, we've released the uh, resource level policies, which gives you more finer gain control, as well as we'll have method level policies coming out as well, really allowing you to tune the policies for every single API. But in addition to that, the, the governance element here is really around the organizational level and global policies that can be applied. Um, they can also be applied at a, at a business group level. And this is important because, as, as we said before, developers are trying to do the right thing. But if every development team has to think about governance themselves and has to think about these policies, you're never quite sure if they've all been applied, and it pushes work down to where it doesn't need to be. So now with global policies, developers don't have to worry about it, and you can know that as policies are, are, or as uh, proxies and as APIs are applied to different environments, all those policies can be automatically uh, laid down on top. Now as we look at these policies and we look at governance, um, What's interesting is these policies form really the, the first layer um, of our overall security stance. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about security and um, looking at uh, how we think about this. So we talked about the need to have visibility and security and governance built into the underlying platform so every team doesn't have to build it for themselves. Right. In addition, we really think about security both in depth and in breadth. So in breadth across the entire application network, across everything that you're designing and developing and deploying. And in breadth as we look at the detailed functions and at capabilities within each API or within each composite service. And there's the core separation of concerns, which I've already mentioned, where developers can focus on the feature function of what they're building, and somebody else can worry about overall API governance and overall security across the entire system as it comes together. Now, as we look at this, the first layer we have is the application network. And as we think about security, we really think about security in these layers. And the first layer are these API gateway policies that we talked about. Now, in addition to this, what we bring to market is another layer of security around edge policies for things like denial of service or content attack prevention. Um, and also network policies, so you can structure actually um, how you want your network configurations to look inside the context of the application network. And then on top of this, there are services that can be provided, uh, such as tokenization um, and full certificate management. So here we have security in layers on top of the application network. Now, all of these are capabilities that can be defined and uh, policies that can be applied, but in addition to these kinds of security elements, we're also really looking at what happens with the information that we have at runtime. And that's where analytics comes into play. Because on top of all of this, we have the ability to understand what should be happening, and critically, what shouldn't be happening. So things like anomaly detection through certain paths through the application network, or understanding what systems should be hit at certain times of the day or certain times of the year. 
And so through this driving security in depth through all these layers, through the understanding of the behavior of the application network. So these capabilities will be coming out, will be rolling out through the course of this year. And thank you. <laughs> all right, and as we think about visibility um, and insights across your entire business, we think about analytics um, not just for security, but really for providing information across design and management and operations. So let's take a look at what this looks like. This is AnyPoint Analytics. We'll be ingesting content from all these different services that we have running, whether it's your Mule runtime, whether it's your APIs, or even all the way across to all of the tooling that we have in place, helping us to help you understand how your users are using the system, what they're looking for, and their behaviors. This all comes into a real-time analytics engine. We've added a data lake, and we'll be adding machine learning and heuristics on top of that data lake to provide not only the runtime and API monitoring and the notifications and the alerting and the troubleshooting capabilities, but also those data flow visualizations, recommendations, and anomaly detection. And the, the data flow visualization, um, we have some of them out on the uh, pavilion floor, so go take a look, a look at those uh, today after, uh, after we're out of main stage. Now, as we take a look at analytics, um, we really want to think about the advanced elements around recommendations, but also the day-to-day -day usage around analytics and analytics dashboards. It's an example of a consumer dashboard that we have that we're bringing out to really help the users, the consumers of the APIs to understand their usage, to understand the value that they're getting out of the APIs that your teams, that you and your teams are creating. Now, quick example around recommendations. This is our flow designer, and these are the kinds of recommendations that we're starting to uh, bring to market. The ability to know, based on what's in your current flow, based on what business group you're in, and based on what the organization has already used, what other capabilities may be related and may be important to use in this case. And it's not just about um, connectors or external systems. We'll also be able to drive re recommendations based on any content that's inside of Exchange. So all of your best practices, all of your templates, um, all of those capabilities will also be recommended, really truly driving uh, best practices and reuse in the context at the point of need, at the point of design, at the point of development. Now. This completes the design, dev test, deploy, and operate flow. And typically, this is the point at which people start thinking about, now you know, this API is out in production, or the capabilities out in production. Now's the time for me to start publishing and, and engaging um, you know, people using this API with, with you know, API portals and maybe with Exchange. This is how people are using it today. But we really look at Exchange and engagement differently. We look at it as being the center of this entire circle and really driving engagement throughout the entire design to operation lifecycle, enabling engagement through all of our tooling, through all the steps that we have, and through everything that I talked about before. So instead of talking more about this, what I'd like to do is invite Anton Kravchenko on the stage. He's a product manager here uh, in our San Francisco office to help me demo the AnyPoint platform. Thank you, Mark. All right, so if we go to demo, great. So here we are inside the AnyPoint platform, and we'll be running this demo in the context of the uh, Connect Showcase, which is the company that was created for all the demos that you saw yesterday from URI and the team. Here we are on the landing page of our AnyPoint platform. As Mark talked about, we have a holistic view of the platform, including new products such as Exchange 2, Design Center, and Analytics. We'll start with the uh, brand new Exchange experience. As you see out of the box, Exchange comes with a complete listing of free package integration best practices, including examples, templates, connectors, and more. This is great. So all the assets that you see here are published by MuleSoft. So this is available to you and your teams from day one. So this is the out-of-the-box value that you get by using the AnyPoint platform. But in addition to what's being built by MuleSoft, all of our partners, and actually as well as our customers, will be able to publish into this public exchange, enabling all of your public assets to be made visible, searchable, and usable by the broader community. 
And if we go to our private exchange, we'll be able to find even more assets from the Eris presentation yesterday. For those who are not familiar with the private exchange, this is the place where you can publish and discover assets within your organization. So you can see there are even more assets, including extensions, RAML fragments, applications, and even APIs. This is great, Anton. So with Exchange One, right now we have templates and connectors and API specifications. But as Anton mentioned, with Exchange 2, we have the ability to ingest all of these additional assets, whether it's your applications, your services, and critically, those templates, which are actually snippets of RAML and will actually help you define new data types, enabling that to be embedded inside of Exchange. So Anton, why don't you take us into uh, one of the APIs? Uh, let's take a look at it. So here we are on the landing page for our Candidate 360 API. And as you can see, the team did a really good job on documenting it, providing a really good introduction, as well as there is an architecture image that has been uploaded. So Anton, I can see here that um, this API was created by URI. Uh, this was created for the demo yesterday. And I also see that somebody really liked this API. Uh, seems like that was URI, who actually likes his own API. <laughs> OK. So in addition to liking your own API, you'll have the ability to interact with other API designers and developers to really understand how the broader community is using your APIs and uh, you know, get feedback in this way. Now, our customers have also told us um, that dependency management in their systems is, is a critical area for them. And I see the dependency on the right-hand side. Why don't you tell everybody how this will be created? Exchange will automatically list the, uh, the main objects referenced by this API. So this is actually automatically uh, referenced and indexed in Exchange based off the API specification. And critically, you can tell what versions of those the main objects were used. So when the new uh, version comes out, the API owners will be notified. This is great, uh, Anton. So Candidate 360, I love the demo yesterday. And um, I have to say this, MuleSoft is hiring. And so I'm constantly hiring. And so I'll be using this API. I'll be coming back to this one. Um, Anton, how can I remember to use this API effectively for my hiring? Uh, let me actually share that with you. Exchange will make it really easy to share any assets with uh, developers and users within your organization. So here you go, Mark. You just got an access. Great. And now, now, when I come back, I'm going to need to know how to actually use this. So why don't we show everybody the reference? And for this, let's go to the API reference. Um, and, and take a look into the actual API specification. So this is automatically generated for you based off the API specification that describes this particular API. So simply by having an API specification, this view is automatically generated for your developers. No additional work is needed. All of the markup, uh, the, the, the ability to navigate and search, all automatically created. This is great, Anton. And in order to consume this API, let's take a look into one of the actions. So here we have even more technical documentation uh, that contains everything that you need to consume this particular API endpoint. It includes the commands that you can copy and paste, the HTTP request URL, and even the list and the description of all the query parameters. But what's really important is that not only you have access to all this technical documentation, you can also consume the API directly from the portal. And as we have all the request parameters pre-configured, I'll click on Run, and we have the uh, live API response back in the context of Exchange portals. So this is great. As an API consumer, not only is there documentation for me to read, but I can interact live with that API and really learn at the point of need as I'm going through. So this is really live documentation. This is amazing. So Anton, now that we've taken a look at uh, what it looks like from an API consumer's perspective, why don't will you show everybody what it looks like to actually create one of these APIs? And for this, let's go to our new design center and take a look into capabilities that we'll be providing. So this is the API Design Center. We spoke before about the combination of both uh, APIs as well as those compositions all in a single project environment. And what you can see here on the screen is the list of the projects that have been shared with all the developers within my business group. This really helps to accelerate the collaboration and provide visibility. And as we all know that the API-like connectivity starts with an API design, let's actually take a look into one of the API specifications. So this is the new API designer environment, fully reimagined from the ground up, 
with advanced troubleshooting as well as type ahead controls. And what you can see here on the screen, on the left hand side, we see the list of elements that are part of this API. In the middle, we have the actual API specification described using RUML. And on the right hand side, we have the mocking service and the API console that Mark talked about earlier. But what's really important and critical is that the new API designer comes fully integrated with Exchange 2, where we can go to take a look into the list of the reusable business objects. So this is great. This is, these are business objects. These are those RAML fragments that we, that we mentioned before. These are all stored inside of Exchange, and these form the basis of the domain objects for your entire enterprise. These could have been defined by an enterprise architect and stored there, or they could have been created project by project, really enabling Exchange to become the clearinghouse for all of these shared constructs and enabling easier access at the point of design. Now, in addition to increasing quality uh, by having access to these domain objects, we also want to increase quality by enabling testing of these APIs as well. And for this, let's take a look into one of the uh, tests that we've created for this API. And as you talk about, Mark, uh, moving testing early in the cycle ensures higher quality results. And for this, we've built the visual API uh, testing framework that makes it even easier to create tests right in the context of the API designer. This is really exciting, Anton. So now that we've created an API um, and it's ready to go, why don't you show everybody how we can help people really take advantage of these APIs by creating a flow? And for this, let's go back to our um, design center and take a look into one of the Mule app projects. So this is the new flow designer. What you see here is these cards across the bottom enabling a more visual interface and allowing those ad hoc inter integrators to really come into the environment and start learning how to use data from these different systems. And we know how important it is for you to understand your flows and data inside them. So we made it really easy um, to actually understand what each step is doing. So you can see that there is an operation name on the card, and you can see how it changes the data. Uh, we can, if we look into this particular flow, we'll see that it starts with the basic polling. It calls the candidate 360 API that we've defined um, earlier to get the list of candidates. It transforms the data and it loads all those candidates into the Greenhouse API. And let me actually show you how easy it is to transform data. Um, here you can see DataViv. It has a really nice visual interface that allows you to um, do the mapping from the source to destination. And on the right-hand side, you see the preview panel that illustrates the output payload. And the last component, once we're done with the mapping, the last component that we have in the flow is the actual greenhouse smart connector that has been automatically created for you based off the API specification that has been uploaded to Exchange. So we saw a data weave built in, and we also see one of those smart connectors. Just by having an API specification, an instant connector is created to greenhouse. This is great, Anton. So now we've seen how we start off in Exchange as an API consumer, as a service consumer, how we've moved over to the development side and actually created that API and created that flow. Now what I'd like to show is how you can think about your overall transformation initiatives. As you think about how the velocity of your teams is increasing, let's show people how we can take a look at the big picture. And for this, let's go to analytics and take a look at our new KPI dashboards. So here we have our new analytics dashboard allowing you to take a look at these core metrics. Now, these are a set of metrics. It's the initial set of metrics that we've gathered by talking with many of you, with talking with many CIOs, around how transformation initiatives are actually measured, the velocity at which teams are progressing and the success of those teams. And all these KPIs are across the top are uh, quickly surfaced, allowing you to really focus on the key areas where you might need to adjust something for one of your teams. We also have the development pipeline across, showing really the flow of uh, APIs as well as components progressing across from desktop all the way into production. And then there are these key APIs around agility, uh, reuse, security, engagement, and operations. Again, allowing you to drill down and focus down at the specific point where you need to maybe apply a little bit more focus or you need to help your teams really drive through on the transformation initiative. Thanks, Anton. Thank you, Mark. Now, we just showed a lot in that demo, and I'm sure all of you are wondering exactly when all that innovation is going to be released. Well, 
I'm happy to announce that everything you just saw is going to be available as part of the AnyPoint platform June release, which we are calling Crowd. Thank you very much. We, we are as excited about this release as you are, and I will take that uh, applause back to the teams that are working on this right now. Now, the reason that we are calling this release the crowd release is because all of that innovation that we just showed is really, truly targeted towards helping your development teams work in the right way, work in the best way possible. With those well-defined contracts, with reusability and recomposability as a core principle, with discoverability, truly driving inherent collaboration across all the teams, enabling you to harness the power of the broader enterprise, and really enabling you to see the power of participation. Thank you very much.